This is Walberto Garcia Jones, and please uh, tell a little bit about yourself if you want. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for having me. It was a little bit of uh, an odyssey to get here. Uh, it was an adventure. I started out yesterday at 3 p.m. Um, and uh, the bus was delayed for two hours. Uh, then it was delayed for three hours. Then we got on the bus and I was on the bus till 1 a.m. Uh, the bridges were closed so I got back home. And uh, I, I got home. I, I don't love to do uh, public speaking, so uh, when I got home, I was tired. You know, I, I, I felt really bad for, for Dawn because I know she's worked so hard to put this together. Um, and uh, I was like, you know, there's really nothing I can do. Um, I can't make it. You know, there's no electricity. I don't want to leave my wife at home alone with the kids. And um, then I, uh, you know, I heard that uh, Dr. Hunter was having a hard time coming here. And I heard that he slept at Union Station in DC trying to get here and wasn't able to make it. So I'm like, well, look, if, uh, if he tried that hard, I'm going to try a little harder. So anyways, thankfully, at that moment, the electricity came back on and I felt a little better leaving my wife. And I brought my, my son, Santiago, who's never uh, really seen me uh, speak. <laughs> he's, he's my oldest. Uh, I have five. Santiago's nine years old. Um, and um, I guess the, the talk that I'm going to give today is this? Okay. Okay, perfect. Could we make sure the microphone Okay. Um, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to not stay by my computer because, as I said, I'm not a gifted order, and if I start looking at slides all the time, then it's going to be really boring for you. Um, so the talk today is about um, incrementalism and why I personally think it's not the right strategy, why it hasn't been the right strategy in the last uh, uh, 45 plus years since Roe, and why I don't think it'll ever be the right strategy. And it's something that I always have trouble uh, speaking about because it's so problematic in, in our work and it's so, it causes so much uh, strife and, and uh, fratricidal battles in the pro-life movement um, that I try just to focus on the, the projects that I'm supporting and making good arguments for them and try not to go back and forth too much because it ends up being just a, uh, you know, frustrating and I feel like it's a waste of time. But more and more I'm thinking that you know, I owe it to just your regular pro-lifer who maybe do, doesn't live this day to day like I do and is, and is really focused on this as a, as a life um, to explain you know, why I think one is better than the other. So, that being said, I, while I think it's an erroneous choice, I would never say that I think that there's a, you know, a motivation uh, that's, uh, that's evil on the side of people who accept compromise legislation. I just think that you know, they're making a strategic wrong move. Um, I do think it's a, it, there's a moral, strong moral element as well, but again, I don't think that you know, it's, uh, it's productive or fair to, to kind of pass judgment on, on their pro-life credentials. So I want to make that clear. Um, so I, I wanted to start with something that's influenced me greatly, which is uh, the, the uh, letter that Martin Luther King wrote from the Birmingham jail to a group of pastors uh, who, who basically told them, you know, you're, you're radical, uh, you're an extremist, you're not, you know, this isn't, you're not from Alabama, uh, you know, you should, you should go and let, you know, let's do this civilly and let, you know, time, uh, give us more time to, to get this done, and he and he responded with a really, really amazing letter, and I think it's it's very pertinent to this question of whether we should accept incremental uh, change. And so, um, let's see. So, the the fundamental question for me, in why I've never liked incremental legislation, is because very, very often it's it's <laughs> compromised, morally compromised, and so. When we start talking about, you know, morally compromised laws, I think it's important to kind of dig deep and, and think about what constitutes an unjust law. Um, and so here, I think we can go to the the letter from Martin Luther King uh, for some guidance. And I think it's he he states it really well. There's a there's a dramatic reading that I I uh, pulled off the internet that I think is kind of cool. Um, so I can play that for you now. At first glance, it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, 
How can you advocate breaking some laws Sorry. and obeying others? The answer. One second. Let me try to put this on full screen. Uh, right at the bottom. Anger and full screen. Sleep deprivation. <laughs> at first glance, it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. So, Sherrod Brown, unfortunately, he has 100% pro-abortion uh, <laughs> voting record so I think he's not really thinking through what he's what he's saying but clearly abortion is something that doesn't just degrade human personality it's contingent on eliminating the very essence of of, of humanity which is that that person that recognition that there's a there's a person there um, so something that's interesting that that is very key to this debate between incrementalism and the opposite, which I think I would call personhood, is the responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Um, and in our in our debate, I think uh, as as an attorney um, and in a movement that's mostly led by attorneys, um, we often hear the the argument that you know we have to change the Supreme Court. We can't present arguments for personhood because you know they're not there yet. Um, and so there's this, this constant return to, you know, obey, basically obey what the Supreme Court has, uh, has said. Uh, you, you know, you're a fool. Uh, I've been called uh, a fool tilting at windmills by the, one of the, the heads of uh, National Right to Life for promoting personhood <clears throat> because they say this is going against the established precedent. And so if we view abortion as, and, and Roe versus Wade and all the rulings of the court as unjust, then we have a moral responsibility to go and to oppose those, um, those rulings. In, in the case of abortion, the child can't do that for himself or herself because they're in the womb. So I think it's, it's, it's our job to do so. And I would say that passing laws or, or trying to pass laws that go directly against the rulings, these unjust rulings, is, is how we do it in a civil society. Um, so, here I have an excerpt that I want you to listen to uh, from Roe versus Wade, from the oral argument, and I think it, it highlights, uh, being in a person of New York meeting, it highlights the centrality of, the, of personhood, of the meaning of the word person, how they twisted this and used it to, to uh, legalize abortion. And this is the actual argument between the justices and um, Sarah Weddington, who was the attorney trying to uh, argue for, for abortion. It seems to me that it is critical first that we prove this is a fundamental interest on the behalf of the woman, that it is a constitutional right. And second, okay, and second, that the state has no compelling state interest. Okay, and the state is alleging a compelling state interest. I'm just asking you under the All of the cases, the prior history of the statute, the common law history would indicate that it is not. The state has shown no 
super critical because I think we've been caught for 45 years in this catch-22 that was set up right here and that and that the the justice actually recognized he says well if if you're dealing with the interests of a woman a person and the interests of nothing <clears throat> then aren't the interests of the woman always gonna win is there even a balancing there and that's the truth <clears throat> because the child in the womb is not considered a person then Everything, everything that we've done, every law that, that we pass, as long <clears throat> as the court finds that it's some way limiting that right of the woman, is unconstitutional. Because what's the benefit? You, the benefit would be that you're protecting the rights of a human being, of a person. But the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade ruled that they're not a person. So, you know, it's a catch-22 again. Um, the, the, I think it's very illustrative, I'll get to this in the later point, but the last case that was decided in, in 2016, the Hellerstedt uh, case, I think draws this to, to its maximum expression, at least in the last 30 years in terms of constitutional jurisprudence, that there, there is no concern in, in our current constitutional law for the rights of the freeborn. And so really all of this incremental change is is meaningless because we don't recognize that there's even a bearer of rights there to benefit. Um, so I, I'm going to keep going. Um, I think this will come into more clarity, but the, the moral conclusion is that laws that allow abortion are manifestly unjust laws because they deny the very right to exist to those least capable of defending it. Um, and I don't know if you if you recall from what the argument was there in, in, uh, in the Supreme Court decision, but um, they said, at one point Sarah Weddington says that all the precedent indicates that they're not a person. Well, they were flat out lying. Um, they didn't have the type of legal search engines that we do now, so I think in part some of the justices weren't able to find these cases that were a little more obscure in terms of, of the rights of the, of the child and how they were treated legally before birth. But we do have them now, and, and so this is just a, a short little snippet of some, some uh, opinions that I think are indicative that it was, you know, th this denial of personhood, uh, historical denial of personhood was a complete farce. In uh, 1818, Chief Justice John Marshall, one of the founders of American jurisprudence, uh, said the words, any person or persons are broad enough to contemplate, to comprehend every human being. Um, and that really was the, the common sense um, meaning of the term person. It was that person is synonymous to human being. Um, now, in MacArthur versus Scott, 1885, the U.S. Supreme Court held that when three born children in the womb were cut out, of, cut out of a probated will without proper representation in court, the right to due process of the preborn child was violated. So, children had a right to due process even in property. Imagine what how much more of a right to due process they would have, they would have before they're deprived of the right to life to exist. Wow. Um, in Wong Wing versus the United States, 1896, the term person is broad enough to include any and every human being within the jurisdiction of the republic. This has been decided so often that the point does not require argument, <laughs> re-argument. Um, Steinberg versus Brown, in 1970, so just a couple of years before Roe versus Wade, the court rejected a challenge to Ohio's abortion laws, this is a, a federal district court, holding that the implied rights of privacy must inevitably fall in conflict with the express provisions of the 5th and 14th Amendments that no person shall be deprived of life without due process of law. So they even had precedent on point um, regarding personhood and the rights of the child vis-a-vis -vis abortion um, just within a couple of years. So this was a very dishonest argument. Um, and. Uh, and so, you know, 
what they were saying, the argument that Sarah Weddington was making was a, a false one. I think she knew it too. Um, so overall, I don't want to dwell too much on the legal aspects of Roe, but I do think it's important to know a little bit of, about the, the foundation for the arguments for personhood, legal arguments for personhood, before we start comparing it to incrementalism. Uh, just a quick debunking of Roe's arguments. Obviously, uh, the, the statement that when life begins is subjective, philosophical, religious uh, concept is scientifically dishonest. It's, it's kind of trendy to say, well, they didn't know then, but you know, we embryology developed after that. That's baloney. Um, we had the American Medical Association pushing for uh, the, the pro-life laws, the, the anti-abortion laws in the 1850s, 1860s, because at that time they were actually finding out more about quickening and embryology. And it was the Amedic American Medical Association itself that was pushing for the anti-abortion laws. Um, so this whole idea that it's that it's somehow you know a, a scientifically impossible point to determine or anything it's it's false. Um, again, the the fact that the preborn are not constitutional persons that somehow the Constitution didn't contemplate the idea that you could have you know non walking around uh, persons like uh, Justice Scalia uh, referred to them. Um, I think it is false. Also, I do think that the the framers of the uh, the 14th Amendment we're thinking about broader personhood and uh, a broader meaning to the term human being than just African Americans that were the basic focus of the 13th and 14th Amendment, but they, they knowingly made it broader. Um, and, and one interesting point that I want to make, because this is something I run across all the time with sort of uh, either law students or, or pro-abortion attorneys, is they say, well look, it's very clear in the Constitution that uh, all, that it refers to all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof as citizens of the United States, right? So clearly the, the Constitution meant to protect, to really only protect people after they're born. That's, a, that's a, actually a terrible argument because the Constitution, when it refers to citizenship, yes, it, it mentions birth, but it, when, when it refers to the right to life and the basic rights, it refers to a person. And that makes sense if you think about it in a different context, say in the context of somebody traveling uh, to the United States. Well, they're not a U.S. citizen, but they don't check their right to life at the gate when they you know, board in, in Paris. Uh, they still have their fundamental rights protected by our Constitution. Um, so, again, I think we all know here, if you came to this conference, you're probably well-versed enough to know most of these arguments, but I think it's important to kind of uh, keep, keep uh, harping on it, that Roe versus Wade was really a, a very, very poor decision. And this is something that even liberal legal scholars uh, will admit. And look, uh, Lawrence Tribe is a very liberal Harvard law professor. He says, one of the most curious things about Roe is that behind its own verbal smokescreen, the sub substantive judgment on which it rests is nowhere to be found. <laughs> now, I think the interesting thing there is that it, it kind of points us as to a, a deeper root of this problem. Abortion um, is, is not the problem itself, in my, in my mind. Abortion is the result of a deeper problem. And I think that problem is... Um, oops. It's in a, in a further slide. But I think that, that problem is threefold. It's the secularization of America. It's the moral relativism that flows from that secularization um, and the radical individualism. And this is a theme that Professor Charles Rice always uh, brought out in his lectures about natural law. And, and so, you know, when, when, you, when you try to, to, to draw out substantive judgments, right and wrong, how can you do that in a society that, for example, says that in its constitutional law, um, morals and views are so relative that you can't distinguish pornography from Shakespeare. It's very hard to draw any kind of moral basis when you've accepted moral relativism to that degree. And we have. And we've, we've also, as a, as a country, allowed the Supreme Court to shut out religion from our laws. Now that's not, I, I think this country was founded on freedom of religion, so how you worship and the specific theology that you adhere to was something that is very central to, to our country, but it never meant divorcing our country from God. It was quite the opposite. Um, and so that's something that, again, has been constitutionally imposed from the top down. 
And I think now through the educational system, through our culture at large, it's something that's accepted. I mean, if you go and you make a religious argument, uh, you know, it's, it's perfectly fine to uh, mock you and to basically disregard whatever it is you're saying. Um, and so uh, that, I think, is closer to the root of the problem uh, of abortion. Because if you get rid of, of, of morality of the sense, and I'm not talking about specifically Catholic moral, morality, I'm talking about natural rights, um, rights that are so fundamental that are self-evident to a Methodist or a Baptist or a Catholic. Um, or even a Hindu or a Muslim. Um, and so we've, we have gotten rid of these, these elements, and I think the result is uh, you know, pornography, is euthanasia, which is, I, I know you've touched on this morning, it's, um, it's abortion. Um, I think it'll be infanticide. I, it, I mean, I'm partial birth abortion, and, and, and some of those methods are already infanticide. So um, all of those, those things flow from this rejection um, of of a creator, of right and wrong, and the embrace of the individual being the ultimate arbiter of everything. Because if you, if you kick out God, then the only thing that's left is me, right? I get to decide. Um, and so that's one point where I think Catholic uh, teaching has been very, very on point, and it's with contraception. So I think contraception really draws on that third point of dominion, the fact that you know, under our, our modern uh, thinking, our secularist, humanist thinking, um, you know, whatever I think is, is the truth. And so if, if I'm God, I get to decide when I have children um, and how I have children. And maybe if I, you know, interrupt the pregnancy of the child as he's, he or she is uh, in gestation. Um, and so I think those things are really linked. I've, uh, I've noticed, you know, a lot of Protestant friends who, um, whose theology doesn't really explain, they don't have a theology of the body, they don't really uh, understand, I think, like, like Catholics do, in large part thanks to St. John Paul II um, and, and uh, Paul VI, and, and all of our theology, that, that element, the contraception, is, is really an intrinsic evil. Um, but I notice that most of them have big families. And it's simply because, again, they embrace that God is in charge in their lives. And if God's in charge in your life, then he really knows if you can handle that fifth child um, or that sixth child. Um, and he can, you know, he, can, he can help you if you're in an unplanned pregnancy. You don't need to kill the child. And so I think all these things flow together. Um, so Martin Luther King, and again in the letter to Birmingham Jail to circle around, he has four points that he lays out that are his ways of overcoming this racial injustice. Um, first, he says, collect the facts and determine whether an injustice exists. And so, um, you know, I think I heard uh, uh, you mentioned before how, you know, the, victim, the victimhood of, of uh, African Americans were, and, and I think a lot of the millennials today, where immediately we come with a, with a victim mentality. Well, I think that first point is critical to say, you know, is there really a, a, uh, a fact that determines that there's an injustice? And not just how you feel about it. Right? It's not just that you feel that, oh, you know, the world is so hard, I don't have everything I want. No, is there really an injustice? So you, you, di you dig deep and you figure that out. Uh, the second is you try to negotiate. Um, you try to engage in civil uh, discourse, in politics, in the ways that you know, we peacefully uh, find uh, solutions to disagreements. The third, I think, is very important, self-purification. I think it, in, in abortion, it, it's something that I, I face every time I go to an abortion mill to pray. I, I get angry. Um, I have a really hard time just focusing and praying and, and you know keeping kind of a, a steady heart because I see what's happening and I've, I'm an act, I'm an action oriented person. I feel helpless. You know I know that I'm not going to go and you know, shoot anybody. I'm not going to do anything violent. It's not what I believe. At the same time, I see violence taking place right in front of me. So it, it, that requires great prayer. And I can imagine with Martin Luther King. Seeing you know, seeing people uh, have to suffer the injustices that they were suffering um, would also require incredible restraint um, and prayer. And so I think that's a really important one. That oftentimes a lot of pro-life groups, uh, because they don't want to seem religious or whatever, they kind of leave the the religious uh, faith spiritual element out. I think it's a huge mistake. I don't think we can do it without it. Um, and the last one is direct action. Here, a lot of times, it's the opposite. It's the people who are religious, who are law-abiding, they believe in law and order, 
they don't want to engage in civil disobedience. Uh, that's kind of, you know, that's what the, the anarchists do. You know, we, we lobby. We go and we have our red rose dinner and we, you know, do these very nice, polite things. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have to engage in direct action. Um, and so that was part of what Martin Luther King was telling these, these, uh, these uh, Alabama, they were mostly, uh, I guess, uh, Protestant bishops. Um, you know, he said, we tried these things. We've tried, how long have, have our people suffered here? It's 350 years? Um, isn't that long enough? Isn't it time we actually stood up and, and, uh, and stopped this? And so um, this idea that now is not the right time is the number one justification for incrementalism. They say, well, you know, we can't, we can't uh, sit by and do nothing, which is true, so we'll try to do a little bit. We'll try to save just one baby. You know, yes, it'll include rape, incest, health of the mother, uh, 29 weeks, whatever, but at least we, we're trying to save one baby. And I understand that sentiment. Um, but that, that argument that now's not the right time has been made, I think, to every campaign for social change, and it always leads you nowhere. It's, it, and, that, and that's what Martin Luther King says. He says, wait has almost always meant never. Um, so here's another segment of that. We know from painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in view of those who have not suffered from the disease of segregation. For years now, I've heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. So he says something very interesting there, um, and, and that's that when you aren't suffering the harm yourself, it's a lot easier to say, let's wait. And in, in that sense, most of us um, aren't suffering the harm of abortion, right? It's happening, happening in a pretty uh, hygienic, out of the way place that unless you go to the abortion clinic to pray and you get a little close to there, but you really don't get, you know, you don't get to see it yourself, um, we're not, we don't have that sense of urgency. Um, and so I think I, I, have, I have to uh, struggle with that, right? I have to uh, push myself to, to really see the fact that this is happening. Um, and I think, you know, uh, bishops, uh, priests, all po politicians, everybody's got something else on their plate that's in front of them uh, and that they, they feel is more urgent than abortion. This is true. Whether, you know, churches have to run, they have to keep the lights up, and, and you know, politicians have budgets to pass, and, uh, you know, judges have dockets to, to uh, go through. And so, I think every, and pro-lifers have money to raise, right? You've got, you've got to, you know, go meet with the wealthy donors, and you've got to do these things, and you've got to make sure your, your uh, uh, ducks are in a row. And so, I think everybody has this excuse, and because of the nature of the battle that we're engaged in, um, the baby can't speak for himself or herself. Um, and, and so it's a lot more tempting to just choose these delay tactics. Um, and how many, how many people have heard, oh, you know, we just need one more Supreme Court justice. You know, we, just, we just need to elect you know, Joe Republican um, to the seat, and then, you know, then we'll be, it'll be the right time. Well, the people who've been around longer than I have, and myself, I've already seen this, right? We've had, I've lived now through, I think, two Congresses where we have a president in both chambers of Congress that are Republican and pro-life. And, you know, we can't defund Planned Parenthood. We can't keep a politician from saying, you know what, uh, my base is pro-life, I don't want their money to go to kill children. We can't even get that. Um, so, you know, there's a serious problem here in, in, act, in the inaction that we have. Um, as an example close to home for me, um, I've always struggled because I, I'm a faithful Catholic, I love the church, and yet my number one stumbling block has always been the Catholic church, the lack of support from the, from the bishops. And this is something that Dawn, that one, one day when she called me, uh, I don't know, it was like almost 10 years ago or something, 
And we were talking, I remember I told her, I'm like, you know, you, she was on fire to get things going. Um, I was like, okay, Don, you're, you know, you're going to go through these, these steps and they're going to hurt because everybody goes through them and, you know, your, your closest uh, advisors, spiritual advisors are going to abandon you eventually. And you're going to have to go, go alone on this. And uh, to her credit, Don has, for the most part, it's part of why I made an extra sacrifice to come out here because I remember how hard she tries. She reminds me a lot of my mom, who's just like her, and is a pit bull and won't give up. Uh, and it's what it's it's the attitude we need to have. And so here we have. This was this, um, actually my my brother was going to come. My brother's studying physics at Columbia, and he has an exam, so he didn't. I'm going to go see him later. But he was going to come, and I remember he was just a little boy in 2008 when we were collecting signatures. It was it was a fall in Denver. It was cold. We were freezing, our pens didn't work because the ink wasn't running, and we were outside of the cathedral collecting signatures. Um, at the time, I made $1,000 a month. Uh, Santiago was, I, he had just been born, so he was a couple months old, and, um, and we were just scraping by to do this, uh, fighting for every signature. We were outside of the, the cathedral, and the security guard came out and told us that, um, you know, the church had told them to kick us off, that they didn't want us even on the sidewalk. And so, the sidewalk, obviously, I could have, you know, being a lawyer, I could have said, well, you know, it's public access, I'm not going anywhere. But again, that kind of uh, uh, blow is something that, unfortunately, you have to deal with. Um, and they issued this statement. They said, we, we admire the goals of this year's effort to end abortion. And I know they, they sincerely did, because one of the bishops is a personal friend of mine, um, Bishop Conley, a really, really solid bishop, Orthodox bishop. And he says, and, and we remain committed to defending all human life from conception to natural death. As we've said from the start, however, we do not believe that this year's Colorado Person Amendment is the best means to pursue an end to abortion in 2008. Unfortunately, even if this year's Person Amendment is passed in Colorado, lower federal courts interpreting this amendment will be required to apply permissive 1973 Roe v. Wade abortion decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. So basically, they're saying wait. Um, and, you know, the Supreme Court is not going to is not going to change their mind on their own. Somebody has to go up there, or make, make the case. Um, and all of the arguments um, that have been made before the Supreme Court, and I read all of them uh, recently for the, for the article that I wrote for the book that Don has for sale. Um, the, there was only one, one lawyer who actually made a strong personhood argument, and, and he won. <laughs> Believe it or not, he, he won. He was an attorney. Um, who was fighting for the Catholic hospitals in, I believe it was Cleveland, to not have to perform any abortions, any abortions at all. And he made a direct um, argument that the Catholic hospitals believed that, that there were two patients and that under no circumstances were they going to um, agree to the murder of one of their patients. Um, and he talked about personhood, and you could just we don't have the video, but we have the audio. There's just you know crickets, and you can hear. And some, some you know one of the one of the justices go kind of guffaws and, uh, well, we're not really talking about that. Let's you know let's get into the nitty gritty of the of the procedural arguments, um, because they don't want to be confronted with that question. Um, to to have to think through the fact that you have an obvious biological human being that is being denied their constitutional rights, any constitutional rights less constitutional rights than an animal has, um, right? There's, there, there are laws in almost every state against animal cruelty. Yes. Um, and we have no laws against any sort of uh, abortion. And, uh, so anyways. <laughs> Excuse that, me, can I answer that? Yeah. But I just saw on the news a week ago that now they want to anesthetize the lobsters before they boil. Sure. And, and in courts in New York, actually, they don't they're. Want to do it to the babies, and they're going to be brutally. And there's a habeas corpus uh, petition for some chimps in New York that they're persons, so we're giving personhood to, to animals um, and denying it to you know children before they're born. So again, moral relativism, right? There's no right, and there's no wrong. Uh, that's where it leads you. Um, there's nothing outside of government. There's nothing outside of uh, under our judi judicial supremacy uh, view. It's even more more extreme, right? There's nothing outside of that one deciding judge. What Anthony Kennedy thinks is the law of the land, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter that God uh, God's law, natural law, reason, science says otherwise. That's that's the law, and we're taking it to the bank. And unfortunately, almost all conservative attorneys <coughs> agree with that philosophy. Um, 
I, I think almost all attorneys, all attorneys, I would say, that are at the, on the Supreme Court, on all federal benches, I don't know that there's a single uh, federal judge um, that, would, that would argue that there's a higher law than the precedent of the U.S. Supreme Court. Thomas, Justice Thomas has, has alluded to it, but he's never actually based uh, a dissent or an opinion on it. Um, so that's, that's how far we are. We're not one Supreme Court justice away. We're five Supreme Court justices away from outlawing abortion, and that's the truth. Um, so compare that again to the statement from, this is a, a verbatim, I, I, I found the article, because the, it's hard to find actually, the letter from these, these uh, Protestant ministers, um, and they say, when rights are consist, uh, consistently denied, a cause should be presented in the courts and in negotiations among local leaders, and not in the streets. We appeal to both our white and Negro citizenry to observe the principles of law and order and common sense. While dogs are being sicked on people, and they're being murdered with impunity. And so, again, I think we need, we need to have a, kind of a, the ability to look at the, the seriousness of this and, and act accordingly, obviously peacefully and as Christians, but to take it seriously and not just kick the, kick the can uh, down, down the street. So if abortion is an unjust law and constitutionally it was morally decided, why do we continue to obey it? So that's a question of why, why hasn't there developed a legal, uh, uh, a legal philosophy that would allow lawyers to, to argue this? And think of, think of this, uh, and it's going to make your blood boil, but in, in terms of the legalization of marijuana, there's a very clear constitutional prohibition against it in the sense that there's federal law that's directly on point that prohibits it, and there's federal supremacy, which is, which is obviously a part of, of our constitutional law, and yet state after state is defying uh, this federal mandate. They're doing that, you know, potheads are doing that, but uh, Christians and pro-lifers aren't willing to go and challenge Roe versus Wade. And so, again, they're, they're actually winning. Uh, during the Obama years, one of the things that, that he said is that they weren't gonna use the Justice Department to enforce that law. So California, Colorado, um, and uh, I think it's Oregon, Washington D.C. A lot of a lot of these more liberal places decided, okay, we're just going to you know defy the constitutional law because we believe in our weird uh, sense of morality that people should be allowed to you know smoke weed. And so, so anyways, but when it comes to pro life, uh, I think you won't find a a national, definitely not a national leader or a, a judge on the bench that's going to say that we need to. Um, Overturn, not overturn, but but um, defy the federal law. I think the one the one guy uh, was uh, was a uh, Justice uh, Moore in Alabama, and unfortunately uh, he had a bad campaign, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and so this is this is a problem. And again, this is because we agree uh, we agree to operate under the assumption that the Constitution requires a strict secularism, moral rel relativism, and radical individualism. Um, I already, I think, touched on this. Um, this is kind of the, the thinking of Charles Rice and uh, his, uh, his ongoing battle with uh, the Enlightenment, which in, in every university, I know in, in my university, in the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where I went to uh, undergraduate school and had my conversion, you know, the Enlightenment is uh, the, the greatest thing to happen to humanity. Um, and. Uh, I think Charles Rice argued that no, that it actually led us down a road where it explains why we've gotten to the point where contraception, abortion, euthanasia, pornography, and homosexual marriage are all um, happening. And again, with homosexual marriage, I think if if you don't have the idea that there's there's a God, that you don't have the notion that there's a, a right and wrong, and you put individualism in the you know the will of the individual above everything else, and why? Why, not? why shouldn't you know Joe and Harry get married? Um, we're not, you know, the law of God says that we shouldn't do it, but that's been thrown out out of the door. You know, right and wrong uh, obviously tells you that. You know, in almost I think in every society, um, this is the, this is known. Um, it's necessary to the creation of the family, to procreation. It's logical. But again, 
uh, we're not we're not going there. And now, of course, with with the idea of uh, the transgender um, uh, movement, right? That's in my mind. That's just an obscene. In case you were blind and didn't see this coming, that's the conclusion of all of this. That's saying there's not even a boy and a girl. Those concepts are somehow um, <laughs> wrong, right? I mean, uh, so that that's that's where we've 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 come. And abortion is just one of the symptoms of that. I don't think abortion is the problem at the root of, of its own problem. We can't, you know, I know I have a, a lot of issues with students for life, for example, because they never want us to talk about God. And they never want us to talk about, you know, morality. And, and I think that's wrong. I don't think we can do that. We have to talk about it because you can't treat the, the, the problem without getting to the root of the problem. Um, and, and I'm not... As a Christian, I'm hopeful. I think I'm always hopeful because I think everything's in the hands of God and, and we already have won the battle. But I, I, I don't like what I see when I look at millennials. Um, my, my little brother's a millennial. Um, he went to the University of Colorado Boulder and now he's at Columbia. And uh, you know the, the questions that they have are so scary. Um, the question of, of animal rights, where they don't distinguish between um, the rights of a, of a human being and the rights of an animal. And you, you know, that's something that they're questioning at this point. So uh, they're, they're completely uh, groundless uh, in, in, their, in their thinking. And, um, and so we need to ground them. And you can't ground them just with a political campaign. You can't ground them with even, even one issue. I think the issue can be a gateway to start thinking about these things, as it was for me. Um, <laughs> But at the, end of, at the end of the day, I think you, you realize what is at the root. Um, let's see. Just a couple of quotes. Uh, I think many of you have probably heard this one from uh, this one of Anthony Kennedy's greatest hits, Casey versus Planned Parenthood. <laughs> at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and the mystery of human life. Um, if that's not uh, groundless, and relativistic, I don't know what is. That's about, the, you know, if you had to come up with a definition of relativism, that would kind of be it. Um, then you have, on the other end, you have the problem of, uh, of people from the school of Justice Reinquist and Scalia, who I think in, it personally were uh, pro-life. And, but, but their legal thinking led them to say things like this. It said, my views that regardless of whether you think pro prohibiting abortion is good or whether you think prohibiting abortion is bad, regardless of how you come out on that, my only point is the Constitution does not say anything about it. It leaves it up to the democratic choice. Some states prohibited it, and some states didn't. What Roe versus Wade said was that no state can prohibit it. That's simply not the Constitution. Who said that? That's Scalia. Who's Scalia? That's just Scalia, who I greatly admired. I, mean, I, I really did. I think he was one of the, the best justices we've had. Um, but he was wrong on this. I think uh, there's a, that whole school of, of law, and this is taught at conservative uh, and Christian law schools. It's, you know, your job as a lawyer is to follow the law no matter what. And there's a problem there. Because what if the law is an unjust law? Do you wash your hands just because you're a lawyer? Um, and so um, this is another... Um, Here's, uh, here's a scene that many of you might remember from Judgment at Nuremberg. Yes. That's right. Oh. That's a trace, yes. The defendant, Phoebe Hoffman, and they addressed the tribunal. This is Justice Scalia and all of the, all of the conservative justices right now. I have served my country throughout my life. And in whatever position I was assigned to, in faithfulness, with a pure heart and without malice. I follow the concept that I believe to be the highest in my profession. The concept that says to sacrifice one's own sense of justice to the authoritative legal law, to ask only what the law is, and not to ask whether or not it is also justice. As a judge, I could do no other. I believe your honors will find me and millions of Germans like me who believe they are doing the duty of their country to be not guilty. 
so what do you do when, when you're a judge and you're faced with an unjust law? It's tough. I'm not, I don't envy that position because I think it inevitably results in ostracism and losing, losing your career. But um, it, nowadays, I don't think it was always that way, but uh, nowadays I think it does in, in terms of any kind of Christian ethic that you're trying to, to defend. This really goes back to the basics. What is the real, natural God's law? The Ten Commandments. How can you articulate stealing? How is it okay to steal? How is it okay to murder? How is it okay to cheat on your wife? These are basic, natural God's laws. And we've, we have walked away from that. And we have to bring that back. And I've always said this from the beginning I started getting active in pro-life, is we have to. The Ten Commandments, the first three commandments, talk about the glory of God, the power of God, the respect for God. And if we don't do that, we're going to lose. Right. And we've lost for the last 60 to 70 years because we had a government that for the longest time, probably even longer, has been trying to take God out of society. And that's the key. Because if you take God out of society, then you say, I'm God, I think it's okay to steal from the Jews, or from the blacks, or from anybody else. So we have to keep God in the mix. Have to, right? And that's I think that's uh, that's my that's my thinking uh, certainly, and uh, and it's unfortunately it, it butts heads directly with this strict constructionist legal um, philosophy that is this is the philosophy that you know all all Republican presidents, the Heritage Foundation that I think does great work in a lot of things, but this is their idea of. The highest ideal, like this judge said, is you know he he doesn't say uh, he just interprets the law and reads the law and he doesn't question it. He doesn't inject his his uh, personal thinking into it. Well, it's a problem when you run into uh, you know, killing the Jews or justifying abortion or denying the personhood of African Americans. You know the Constitution is a man-made uh, uh, instrument. It's it's incredible. Uh, I think it's the you know the, uh, the the best thing since apple pie, but it's not perfect, and it requires a higher law, uh, and that's what what's referred to as natural law. I think the Ten Commandments um, uh, is is obviously a good encapsul encapsulation of it. Um, as a Catholic uh, and a Christian, I certainly believe it. But you know, you look at every every religion, every legitimate religion. Um, is going to uh, have those those principles. It's not a question of imposing one's idea of how to worship um, or even whether to worship. Um, it's an idea that mankind has a nature, and you have to, for the for the social good to be realized, you have to go in accord with that nature. Um, and so that's at the heart of natural law. Um, excuse me. Yeah. But uh, isn't Scalia saying that? that he doesn't want to legislate from the bench? Well, he, in a sense, he, he is saying that. But he's, he's saying something more than that. He's, he's, he's putting forth a judicial philosophy where he removes the, the moral judgment of the judge. Um, and, and I think mm -hmm. you can say, um, you know, I'm, I'm not legislating from the bench when I find that the Bill of Rights um, includes the references to, to uh, the Declaration of Independence and natural law within it. Um, clearly, there's a, there's a right to life in the Constitution, the 5th and 14th uh, Amendment. And uh, you know, why, why, can't you, uh, why can't you uphold uh, the Constitution and the rule of law and your conscience at the same time? I think you always can. <coughs> I think the problem is, just like this judge in Nuremberg, there are these consequences that are very, very harsh consequences. Um, I think, you know, with, with uh, Justice Moore, you saw the consequences of a judge that wasn't willing to take down the Ten Commandments um, and wasn't willing to bow down to, to uh, you know, the, the idea of federal supremacy on an issue that he thought was, uh, you know, was, was wrongly decided. And so, in a, in a sense, there's, there's this notion built into our, our constitutional thinking that the separation of powers, that requires that there's independence in, in thought of the different branches. And we've perverted that a little bit, I think, 
with the notion of judicial supremacy, where there is no balancing of powers. It's whatever five justices of the Supreme Court say is what has to be done. Okay. Okay. I do want to get to the actual, um, the actual uh, kind of current pro-life framework. Um, let's see. I don't know if you were able to read any of those quotes, but these are pretty good. And. I, I agree that there's a danger that I think Justice Scalia was was alluding to, which is the opposite. You know, the, the idea that anything goes, and so the judges can can become the ultimate legislators. But I think there's a there's a middle ground there where you can use reason. I think as St. Thomas Aquinas uh, said to to grasp what the natural law is, and it's not just a religious sentiment. It's something that you can discern and you can apply. Um, okay, in terms of uh, a reality check uh, on the state of the pro-life movement, I am not the most optimistic about it. I think a lot of it uh, is is kind of twisted to make us feel good and to justify fundraising and campaigns and this and that and the other. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think young people are, are more pro-life than ever. Um, you know, I I think that pro-life, the pro-life incremental legislation has not caused a reduction in abortion. Um, you, you see this argument made a lot by somebody named uh, Michael New. He writes uh, extensively. And I think the big problem is what the, the evolving definition of abortion is, um, that more and more we have chemical abortions that are, that are happening and aren't, you know, they're kind of in a gray area. Um, there's more long-term abortifacient contraception that young people are taking. Um, and so, you know, I really don't think that uh, the, the different pro-life laws are, are uh, at the heart of this reduction. There is a reduction in the percentage of surgical abortion that's reported voluntarily by, you know, the very ethical abortion industry. Safe and legal. Right. Um, one, of the, one of the elements here is Hawaii. Hawaii has the greatest uh, reduction in abortions, but they have no pro-life laws. And so I think there's something, something different happening there. Um, the, the perception, again, that, that the country is becoming more pro-life because we're able to push these laws that cause people to think about abortion, even if it's not you know, full personhood. Again, here we have 1975, and the number has gone up by 8% in terms of how many people think that abortion should always be legal. So I don't think we're, we're winning the argument. Um, Hallerstedt, the last opinion that was decided, it took 10 years for uh, two pro-life opinions to be, to be uh, ruled upon by the Supreme Court. And this one basically says that any pro-life law that limits access to abortion is unconstitutional. Um, and uh, the, the, the legislature is not in the position to actually make these these decisions based uh, or these determinations of what's medically uh, best for its citizens the supreme court is going to overrule those if they see that they're intended to reduce abortion so again think about that catch-22 if your pro-life law reduces abortion it's unconstitutional so what's the point <laughs> right um this is a the partial birth abortion um, bill was something that the mainstream pro-life movement, in terms of incrementalism, claimed as a great victory. Um, and I and some others uh, you know, had our doubts about it. It, it took, I don't know, a billion dollars in terms of, of, of uh, lobbying and funding to pass this. And this was the first minute of oral argument. Sorry. First minute of oral argument in defense of the partial birth abortion law. May it please the court. Congress held six hearings over four different Congresses and heard from dozens of witnesses in determining that partial birth abortions are never medically necessary, pose health risks, and should be banned. Under familiar principles of deference to congressional fact finding, those determinations should be upheld as long as they represent reasonable influences based on substantial evidence in the congressional record. That standard is amply satisfied here. The evidence before Congress was clear. 
that partial birth abortions were never medically necessary and that safe alternatives were always available such that no woman would be prevented from terminating her pregnancy. That safe alternatives were always available such that no woman would be prevented from terminating her pregnancy. No woman would be prevented from terminating her pregnancy. Sorry for repeating that three times, but that was a partial birth abortion victory. Mm. We, we only won because we said that it wouldn't save a single baby, that there were, there were always alternatives to, to kill the baby a different way. So in my, in my mind, that is not a, uh, a victory. You know, that's like preventing uh, one form of murder because we're making sure that all forms, all other forms of murder are okay. So no baseball bats, people, but guns and you know, knives and everything else is okay. Now that's meaningless. Um, again, I, I want to drive this home because I think this is where incrementalism has taken us. We don't demand enough, and so we don't get it. Um, here's Justice Scalia. So the Equal Protection Clause requires that you treat a, a helpless human being that's still uh, in the womb uh, uh, the way you treat uh, other human beings. When the Constitution says that persons are entitled to equal protection of the laws, I think it uh, clearly means walking around persons. Walking around persons. So, and here's Gorsuch, uh, who I also think is probably a great judge, but he adheres to this philosophy. The judge's job is to follow the words that are in the law, not replace them with those that aren't. That's what's in the law, but that's not a very easy thing to uphold if you want to get to the Supreme Court. There is a statement which you made in that book, which has been often quoted, and I want to make sure that I quote it accurately here today. It relates to taking a life. The, and I quote, the intentional taking of human life by private persons is always wrong. That was a statement that you included in your book, correct? I believe so. I believe so. How could you square that statement with legal abortion? Senator, as the book explains, um, the Supreme Court of the United States has held in Roe versus Wade that um, a fetus is not a person for purposes of the 14th Amendment. And the book explains that. Do you accept that? That's the law of the land. I accept the law of the land, Senator. Yes. Thank you for the clarification. The unborn uh, person uh, doesn't have constitutional rights. A fetus is not a person. She said person. She said person. She said person. She did contradict herself. The but he contradicts himself too. He's saying if he, he just, you know, enacts what's in the law or, or rules what, according to what's in the law. It's in the law. He knows it. Um, it says you can't get confirmed to the Supreme Court. That's that's true. Um, do we have to end? I'm so sorry, but it's two minutes after five, and I would love to continue, but we have to we have to get out of the room. I'm so sorry. I, I, I try to get as much out of you.